Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone, wherever you're calling from. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Alexis Marcus, and I'm part of the admissions team here at MIT Sloan. I'm so excited to be here today to talk to you about the MBA application and give some tips and tricks on applying. I am joined by a number of my colleagues here to support um, everyone that's on the call today to answer all of your questions. I'm joined by Jen Barba, Terrell Williams, Patricia Chen, uh, Catherine Ferrara, Donna Levinson, Melissa Friedman, Rachel Ferreira, David Merrill. Um, so they're all here. We're all just coming off camera to say hi to everyone. Um, and all of these folks are going to be in the background answering your questions on the Q&A. So I did put this in the chat, but to the extent that you can add your questions to the Q&A, I hope to get to most of them throughout the, the slide part of the presentation. But certainly, if there's any lingering questions, we will get to all of those at the end um, and answer anything that you might have as you're thinking about um, applying to the MBA program. So uh, use the Q&A feature. We also have upvoting set on, on that. So you can, if someone um, asks the question that you're hoping to get the answer to, you can also just upvote the question and we know to, to answer that towards the end. So really excited to be here today and to, to chat with all of you. Um, so as I said, I'm going to go through my slides and talk about all of the different um, programs that we have at MIT Sloan, but really focusing in on MBA. So the first thing that I want to talk about is just the um, mission of the MIT Sloan School of Management, because I really do believe that this is really ingrained in our application and throughout the entire uh, curriculum at MIT Sloan. So the mission of the Sloan School is to develop principled, innovative leaders who improve the world and generate ideas that advance management practice. Um, so as I mentioned to you, we have a really robust portfolio of programs here at MIT Sloan. And today we're gonna focus in on the MBA program and the LGO program is kind of ingrained within that. The LGO is a separate application. We will touch on bits and pieces of it here and there, but there will be other app tips webinars specifically for LGO, but that's another opportunity to get an MBA and a master's in engineering at the same time. But LGO students Students are part of the MBA cohort, so we will be touching on that here and there throughout today's presentation. So we are going to focus in on the MBA program. Folks that come into the MBA program typically have between three to seven years of work experience, with the average being around five years of full-time work experience. Our MBA program is a full-time program. It's two years with the summers off, so it starts in August, and then you would graduate two years later in May. So who is an MBA student? This is the um, class profile for the class of 2023. And as I indicated just a few minutes ago, LGO students are part of the MBA cohort. So this number that you see here includes both LGO and MBA class of 2023. Um, and you can kind of see the different breakdown. Where are the people coming from? Where, how many years of work experience, the global perspectives that are brought to, the, uh, to our class. So 64 countries represented. Often folks are wondering, you know, how many females are in our class? So for class of 2023 is 44% uh, female, 43% international. We had 23% of our class um, were underrepresented minorities. And then on the right-hand side, you can see the um, undergraduate majors in the pre-MBA industries that they were coming in from. So the one thing that I always like to say to students or prospective students, if they're looking at this and they don't see themselves on here, remember that there's always this other category. So even if it's 1% or 2% or 3% at the bottom, there are people that are coming from all different walks of life, all different undergraduate majors. We are not looking just for STEM majors. We have, um, you know, folks coming from English backgrounds, um, you know, humanities. We look at folks from all different backgrounds, from the undergraduate field, as well as the um, MBA industry. So we're not just admitting folks from finance or consulting. Certainly, those are definitely kind of big areas where people are coming from. But, you know, there are a lot of students that are also in smaller niche areas coming into the MBA program. So if you don't specifically see yourself on here, don't think that doesn't mean there's a place for you. There's always places for um, student, great students at MIT Sloan. So as I mentioned, we're going to focus really in on the MBA application today. So we just um, launched the MBA application last week. So if you haven't checked that out, please definitely go online and, and get your application started. But the round one deadline is September 29th. And then we have two other rounds uh, in January and April. They're listed here. I've also put the LGO application um, deadlines on this slide so you can see that. The round one deadline for LGO does overlap with MBA. But again, it's a different application, largely the same components but a couple extra for LGO. And then their round two deadline is December 1. 
So on the left-hand side, you'll see all the different components, and we are going to go through each of these individually to talk about, you know, what does it consist of, what are our tips and, and tricks for um, making the best of your application and the real estate on the MIT uh, MBA application. And then also, we will talk a little bit about interviews as a second, you know, as the kind of that next step in the evaluation process. So just in terms of numbers, I wanted to give you all a sense of, you know, where what we were looking at. So this last year, we had about 5,300 applications. All of the applications were reviewed by our admissions committee. Our admissions committee is made up of professionally trained staff um, and some, you know, some of our contract readers. There are no students um, involved in that process. And so they, every single application is reviewed by that committee. And then about 30% of the applicant pool is invited to interview and then folks are admitted from there. So just to give you a, some sense of the numbers. So I just indicated this, but uh, we do have that professionally trained admissions committee. All of the applications are reviewed and scored for uh, demonstrated success and leadership skills. So some of the things that we're looking for are understanding how well you work with others. How do you lead? How do you problem solve? How do you communicate? Uh, how do you influence and adapt to change? So these are kind of the things to think about when you're thinking about examples to include in your application, letters of recommendation, who you might want to ask for a, a recommendation letter, uh, who can really showcase and answer these kinds of questions. These are the kinds of things that we're looking for in our MBA students. Uh, it's also important to realize that we only review applications after each of the deadlines. So we don't we do not do it on a rolling basis. So for instance, um, our round one deadline is September 29th. All applications must be submitted by 3 p.m. Eastern time on September 29th, and that does include the entire application. So all components need to be submitted by that point. Um, and then at that point, we will start reviewing applications first thing on September 30th after we've kind of looked at the entire pool and the admissions committee will start reviewing at that point. So no, even if you submit it tomorrow, we're not gonna be looking at it until September 30th. So the first component that we're going to talk about today is the cover letter. So the cover letter is really your opportunity. Um, this is kind of what I would say is equivalent to the essay at other um, at other uh, business schools. So this is an opportunity for you to seek a place in the MIT Sloan MBA program. We want you to use specific examples to sell yourself, to tell us why you're a good fit for MIT Sloan and why Sloan is a good fit for you. You really should focus in on more recent examples here to demonstrate that match. Um, it can be a mix of personal or professional examples. You don't need to focus in too much on your future goals. When you do read the specific prompt of the cover letter and the instructions to the application, you'll see that we're not asking you what you want to do with your MBA. We do believe that your past successes are the best predictor of your future performance. And so for that reason, we really want you to focus in on those examples from the past. Um, so talk about, you know, what have your successes been in your um, recent, you know, work history, or if there's anything that you're working on outside of, you know, your professional goals, tell us about that. It really is up to you what you include here. Um, when you think about the cover letter, you'll also want to think about it kind of with the resume. And so the resume is a one page max resume. We do have some um, suggestions that we like to see on the formatting, which I put here on the left hand side. Um, we want to make sure it's easy to read and you want to be focusing in on impact driven bullets. So, you know, quantifiable accomplishments is really what we're looking for on the resume. And so the resume and the cover letter are really going to kind of complement one another. You might have one bullet on your resume, and that might be a success that you've had that you expand upon a little bit more in your cover letter. You do not want them to be duplicative of one another, um, but more complementary. So, you know, taking that real estate to the maximum by focusing in on the 300 word cover letter by all, and also focusing in on that impact driven um, bullet resume that's limited to just one page. You'll want to showcase any, you know, extracurricular opportunities that you've done both um, in your professional organization. So a lot of organizations have extracurriculars or committees that you might have volunteered for. Tell us about those. Any leadership positions that you've held both, you know, in your undergraduate years or if you already have a master's um, in your master's years. Tell us about any certificates that you have. And if you have room for it, let us know about what your personal interests are. I always love to see that on resumes. It's a great talking point too when we get into the interview phase. 
So the video statement is kind of the other piece that um, makes your full circle or your kind of your your um, your picture, the picture of who you are as an applicant. So the video statement, we're asking you to introduce yourself to your future classmates. It's your opportunity to tell us a little bit more that we aren't seeing in that cover letter or aren't finding on your resume. Um, so maybe perhaps it's something that uh, you know you're a little bit you haven't talked about somewhere else, something a little bit more about your background or who you are as an individual. But, you know, I would say, again, using this real estate wisely to not be duplicative of what we've already read in the cover letter. Um, the video statement always tends to be, you know, both most nerve wracking part of the application, but I will say that as part of the admissions committee, it's definitely part of one of our favorite components because we are getting to know the applicant a little bit more to understand who they are, you know, what makes them tick um, and just, you know, get a better sense of who you are of, aside from a piece of paper or your resume. Um, so, you know, the video statement, the cover letter and the resume are really the opportunity to kind of put together your full story. You'll want to keep it simple and use your best judgment when it comes to the video, you know, so as I said, that this is introducing yourself to your future classmates. Think about what you would say when you walk into the classroom at Sloan, um, potentially, you know, a year from now or two years from now, whenever you're going to be applying. What would you say as your introduction, your elevator pitch? Um, but, you know, again, using your best judgment that this is um, introduced, we want you to say what you would say to your classmates, but it is being seen in front of the admissions committee. So, you know, think about maybe what you're wearing or uh, the content of that. Um, you might not want to just say exactly what's on your resume, but then you might not want to be saying something that you'd be saying out uh, with a, um, a group of friends. So just be aware of that. And then beware of your surroundings. So certainly you can be sitting at a computer screen and looking at a cam just like we are right now or doing a selfie on your phone video. But if you are going to be outside or somewhere that there's background noise, just make sure you're watching the video back before you submit it. If you can't hear the content of what you're saying, we're not going to be able to hear it either. And that's really important. So if it's a windy day outside and you're recording outside or, you know, there's a, there's a bus driving by, just be, be wary of that and you might want to re-record. It does need to be one take, no editing and no background music or subtitles. So um, if we can't hear you, you will need to re-record that. And definitely make sure that you show us your personality. So the recommendation letter for the MBA program, we only require one letter of recommendation. Um, I know we will get this question in the chat, so I'm gonna address it now. No, you may not submit more than one letter of recommendation. Only one letter of recommendation is required for the MBA program. Um, and you have the opportunity to do references, which we'll talk about in just a minute. But the recommendation letter, who you choose to write your rec recommendation letter, should be able to you know, talk about your strengths. You know, you'll want to ask that recommender early to talk about, you know, give them a, um, a sampling from we use the GMAC common letter of recommendation. And there's a sample of questions um, in the instructions, as well as if you go onto the GMAC uh, common letter of recommendation um, website, it will show you the different questions that are asked. Those are kinds of the things that we are going to ask them to talk about. And again, going back to what I was talking about before, we want to know how, how do you work in teams? How do you solve problems? How do you communicate? Those are all things that we hope the recommender will be able to address in the letter. Um, Hopefully this goes without saying, but you should not be writing the letter of recommendation for your recommender. This is something that they should be writing and submitting directly to us through our online portal. So when you are ready um, for your recommender to start writing that letter of recommendation, you'll go into your application, you'll navigate to the recommendation letter instructions page, and you'll input your recommender's information. So that'll be their name and their email address. And from there, we will send them an email prompting them to submit the letter of recommendation and asking them those specific questions on the on the GMAC um, common letter of recommendation form. Uh, so again, just one letter of recommendation, make sure that you've asked them early and also give them a reminder uh, of when that's due. So all letters of recommendation are due by the deadline. So we need that letter to be submitted for round one by the September 29th deadline. So the additional references are your opportunity um, to tell us two additional folks that you potentially would have asked for a letter of recommendation should we, you know, if we had asked for more letters. Um, similar to your recommender, they want to be, we want them to be able to speak to your professional aptitude, your successes. Um, the questions that we may ask in your references are very, very similar to those uh, those 
questions listed on the GMAC common letter of recommendation form. Um, and you know, we may or may not contact your references at any point during the evaluation of your application. So at any point in the admissions cycle, we could contact them. So that might happen um, you know, during the read stage or potentially after an interview, but before a final decision is released. And it's it really kind of just depends on the applicant or the interview if we have questions that we would contact the reference. So it will be something where we wouldn't contact them out of the blue. We would send the, your um, reference an email to set up a, a convenient time. If they don't speak English, we will employ a translator and take care of all of those logistics. Um, but nothing that you would need to do other than have your references, you know, aware that we might be reaching out to them via email at some point, you know, in the coming months. Um, but don't think it's positive or negative if we do or do not reach out to your uh, references. So that it's really just depends on the applicant and it's a case by case basis if we reach out. The next thing I want to talk about is the organizational chart. So the organizational chart is part of the application where we're asking you kind of for a one page um, visual sample of where you fall within your organization. So we're trying to understand with the organizational chart who you work with and who you're interacting with on a daily basis. So who are your peers? Who are you reporting to? If you do have any direct reports, who the who those folks are. Um, if you have you know a dotted line to someone, make sure that you include that. We're really trying to understand kind of what your interactions look like in a professional setting, and that might be, you know, a talking point during a future interview as well. Um, so include your organization, your unit or department, make sure you or your supervisor and any of those direct reports are there. And then one of the um, additional things that we asked for this year, so this is new in the instructions for this coming cycle, circle yourself in red. So please use a red circle to circle yourself so we can quickly identify where you fall on the organizational chart. If the organizational chart happens to include who wrote your letter of recommendation or any of your references, um, if you, you know, you've been promoted within your organization and you've held, uh, you know, chose your older roles, you can highlight all of those things for us. It's absolutely not necessary. Your recommender might not be on your org chart and that is completely okay. Uh, just saying those are some things that we've seen in the past that are, you know, helpful should they, should they happen that way. But don't worry if it does not. Um, the other thing I will say, if you fall within an organization that's really large, you, we don't need to see the overall structure of the entire organization. So for instance, if you work for Amazon, um, it's unlikely that Jeff Bezos is going to be on your organizational chart unless you truly are, you know, a couple steps down from Jeff Bezos. We really want to see what your org chart, or excuse me, what your um, department overall looks like, your specific unit. So you don't need to give us uh, something that large if it's a, a really big organization. Um, so similarly, if you are an entrepreneur um, and you work by yourself, you might be wondering how do you do an organizational chart? Think about putting yourself kind of in the middle in a circle, and then who are the folks that you're interacting with? Maybe it's investors, maybe it's a board of directors, um, maybe you have a co-founder. You know, you can get creative with this. We understand and are totally aware that every company and every different organization has a different structure and you might be interacting in different ways. So um, you, you can go on our website. There are some samples there so you can see. Uh, I guess the final thing I'll mention about the organizational chart is for folks that work on kind of project-based work, um, or maybe are in the military, you might want to include, um, we'll use consultants for an example. So if you're doing um, some project-based work, it might make sense for you to include an organizational chart of a recent project that you've been staffed on, as opposed to where you fall within your actual firm. Um, we would like to see kind of who you're interacting with, you know, at the client and um, working with from your, uh, your own consulting firm. And then for military, if you do want to include kind of your military organizational chart, you absolutely can do that. And then if you've had you know, prior work experience, you can include that second you know, um, organizational chart um, you know, to show us what your full-time work experience looks like outside of the military. Um, if you have anything on your organizational chart that's kind of confidential information, um, names that can't be shared, you can always feel free to redact that. To the extent that you can you can share titles, that is very, very helpful so that we can understand, again, who you're interacting with um, on a daily basis. So test scores. 
So this year, um, we have, you know, we are very aware that the COVID-19 pandemic continues to have an impact on many folks throughout the, the world. Um, there are definitely places still in the world that are not able to access a test um, in a safe way, whether that be in person or online. Um, so we are continuing with the test waiver request form in the application only for those that are unable to safely access the exam. Um, so when you uh, go into the uh, application, you will either be required to submit that test score waiver form and be approved by the admissions committee um, or submit a GMAT or GRE score. So we do accept both the online and in-person GMAT or GRE. So make sure that, you know, either is completely acceptable and, not, and neither the GMAT nor the GRE is looked at more favorably and same with the in-person versus um, online. Um, again, the test waivers are really only for those uh, related to safety concerns or inability to take the test due to COVID. We are um, in regular contact with, you know, GMAC and folks that run the GRE exam to talk about what that looks like. So we are very well versed in where um, in the world they are not able to be um, giving out exams at this time. So we will be asked specific details about where you are and why you're not able to take an exam in the waiver. Um, if you are submitting one of those, it will take probably up to a week. I would say, rec you know, recommend getting um, getting in there and getting some information submitted so well before the deadline so that we can review it. And then you'll get an email with the final decision on whether or not the um, test waiver has been approved or not shortly after. So I would say we give it up to a week, but we will do our best to respond very, very quickly. So the academic and relevant coursework sections. So you will need to upload your transcripts from all the schools that you've attended, both undergrad and if, um, if you have a master's degree or you've done any master's programs, transcripts from all of those schools. They don't need to be official transcripts at this point. If you're admitted to MIT Sloan, you will be asked to um, submit official transcripts at that point. But right now, we just need you to upload the transcripts from your schools. Just make sure that, they, again, they're legible. If they are blurry or you can't read them on your computer screen, there's just no way that we can read them on our computer screen. And so we really want to make sure that we can you know, see how your academic success has been. Um, so, so be cognizant of that when you're uploading them. Um, and then you also have the opportunity to send, to tell us any non-degree coursework that you have done. So this might include um, edX courses, or if you've taken MBA math, or um, you know any Coursera courses. There's a lot of different things there. And then professional certificates. So if you have a CFA or CPA, you can include details um, in our relevant coursework slash professional certificates uh, section of the application. We use this information to look for academic aptitude, your comfort with quantitative work. Um, so again, you know, we're not looking for people from a specific STEM background or from, you know, having um, quantitative undergrads. We do admit a lot of folks from different backgrounds and different undergraduate um, majors, but we want to make sure that you are comfortable with the, the curriculum when you hit um, hit the ground at MIT Sloan. And so our core is very quantitative, quantitative and we want to make sure that you have the skills needed um, you know, to kind of hit the ground running, as I just indicated. Does that mean that you would not be admitted? Absolutely not. That does not mean that at all. We just want to make sure that we are giving you all the tools that you need to succeed. So we're looking for what has, um, what have you taken, what experience have you had with quantitative backgrounds, or quantitative courses, and um, what might you need to succeed at MIT Sloan. Um, we're also looking really to understand it, your intellectual curiosity and your, your ability to continue learning um, after your undergraduate years. You know, what have you been doing with additional courses or certifications? It's really always super interesting to me to see the different courses that folks are taking um, to complement their professional careers. And then, of course, understanding any um, the mastery of any subject area, you can include in the, these sections as well. So the next one that I want to talk, the next component that I want to talk about is our newest addition to the application. This is our optional short answer question, and I've included the prompt here. It is, how has the world you've come from shaped who you are today? For example, your family, culture, community all help to shape aspects of your identity. Please use this opportunity if you would like to share more about your background. So I want to emphasize that this is truly, truly optional. There will be no negative or positive inference if you do or do not respond to this question. 
we added this question as a uh, you know response to many many questions or requests from students to be able to have more real estate to tell us more about themselves you really may have answered this question or told us everything you wanted to answer in the rest of the application in all of the other components and you don't need to respond to this but should you want to tell us a little bit more about your identity or where you come from this is your opportunity to do so um, it's limited to 250 words and it is a text box answer so we are not looking for links to external sites we are just looking for text um, i'm sure there'll be plenty of questions on this and i'm happy to answer those but the thing I want to stress the most is it's truly optional. If you do not want to submit anything and you've answered all of um, the other you know, parts to the, the application and you've told us everything that you want to tell us, then that, that is completely fine. But um, if there's something else you know, with regards to your identity and, and who you are, please absolutely share. We would love to learn more about you. So after you submit the application, uh, as I indicated, we will start quickly, you know, the next day reviewing your application. So it, it's a quick turnaround. 3 p.m. on the 29th, we'll start looking at the overall applicant pool. The admissions committee is going to start reading first thing on the 30th. Um, from there, we will read for about four weeks or so, um, and then we'll make our decisions for interviews. If you are invited to interview, so I think that my one of my first slides said about 30% are invited to interview. And if you are invited to interview, you'll get an invitation. Um, and there'll be two additional short answer questions that you'll have to submit online 24 hours before the interview. So the interview itself, I'm leaving this here for now. For right now, the interviews continue to be virtual 30 minute interviews. If anything changes with that, we will certainly be in touch, but final decisions on the format of interviews has yet to be decided. So we're sticking with just virtual for this uh, webinar here today, but we will definitely be in touch if anything changes there. And then we will be asking you behavioral based questions during the interview itself. And we're looking for more examples. So you want to be thinking about additional examples that you would be sharing during the interview that you didn't share during the written part of the application. So if you highlighted certain examples in your cover letter, uh, you might be wanting to think of different examples for the actual interview itself. Uh, and so we're looking again for why did you do something? How did you do something? Those specifics on how you worked with the team. How did you, how were you a leader? Um, have you mentored someone? Those are the types of questions that we would be asking during an interview. So don't worry, you know, that, that part of the application and that part of the evaluation process is a little ways away. Um, but this is just kind of to give you a sense of what would happen in an interview down the line um, if you are invited. So a couple additional admissions tips and tricks that I have for you are um, to apply early, follow the directions, be yourself. I always like to say, we are looking for reasons to admit you. We are your advocates and help us gather that data. So when you're thinking about your application and all the components that we just went through, look at it as a whole picture. Understand if there's holes in it. Think about whether or not if you were, you know, an outside party reading all of these materials that you've submitted, if there's a hole as to, you know, anywhere in your application that we're wondering, hmm, I wonder what happened during that period or, you know, what, what's going on there. I think the thing to remember is that the admissions committee is made up of people. We are, you know, we want to know what was going on in your life. We understand that life happens and sometimes you you have a bad semester in college or you know you were having a bad few weeks at work. Things happen and life happens. Just make sure that you tell us what was going on so that we don't wonder. There's plenty of opportunities on the application itself to tell us about gaps um, in your employment, any you know bad semesters that you had in college um, or, or you know your master's program. Um, and if you if there's something that you do want to address, you can always send us an email and we can add that to your file as well. You know, if there's if there's something that's just not, you know, putting two pieces together and you're not sure where to address that, we can help you help you walk through that. Um, but just make sure that you're yourself. We are really excited to read all of these applications. Um, I can tell you that everyone on this call today feels fortunate to be part of the admissions team at MIT Sloan and to read all these incredible applications, meet incredible folks throughout the interview process and, and really understand, you know, what their goals are, you know, where they're coming from. Um, and, you know, we're excited to meet you. We're excited to learn more about you and hopefully have you all at um, MIT Sloan in the future. 
So I'm going to answer questions, but I just want to make sure that I, I also highlight some upcoming events. If you haven't already um, registered for some of these great events that we have upcoming, definitely check out our website. Um, I think probably someone, if they haven't already, haven't checked the chat, but if someone could just drop in our events website, that would be great. So you can register for all these um, identity inclusion series, those kick off next week. So they, we have a number of those. We also have a monthly on-campus info session. So if you are in the Cambridge area, you could register for one of those. They all are live streamed as well. Jen will be hosting one this Friday. Um, and then I think Donna might be hosting one in August. We also have in-person alumni panels coming up. We're so excited to be back on the road. Um, so we have New York, DC, San Francisco, um, and Cambridge upcoming, and then so many more virtual events. So certainly if you're not in any of these hub cities or you're not in Cambridge, don't worry. We have tons and tons of events coming up. So um, please register and come to any of those upcoming events. So at this point, I will invite Jen to come back on. I have not been looking at all in the, Q and A or the chat. So share with me what's happening. You're on mute. We have lots of great questions. Okay. Um, and thank you to everyone behind the scenes who's um, who's working on these questions. I've, um, I have a handful ready for you. So um, the first one that has the most upvotes, as a well-known school for many engineers, how is MIT's approach to a less quantitative skilled candidate, meaning people from humanities or social sciences? Yeah, absolutely. So as I mentioned, we have tons of um, students from different backgrounds and we're not looking for folks from just quantitative backgrounds. Oftentimes you might get your quantitative skills um, on the job. So in a professional setting, and we are definitely well versed with, with seeing um, candidates that have gained those gained those quantitative skills on the, um, in their professional career. So that's one way. Um, maybe you, you don't even have quantitative skills from your professional career. You come from um, more of those liberal arts backgrounds. That's OK, too. We Again, we just want to make sure that you're set up for success. So we have, from time to time, done what we call conditional admission. And we ask you to take some classes to prepare you for the MBA core curriculum. Um, you know, we, we are quantitatively heavy uh, school and then you know the it is important that you are ready to kind of hit the ground running but we will help you with those resources to say these are the things that we we need you to do or that you should be doing um in order to succeed in the classroom and so you would not be looked at negatively should you not have that quantitative background we just want to understand that so that we can set you up for success okay perfect um a question about reapplicants so it does it does it come off as you're being indecisive if you change your post MBA goals in your new application? And also, if you work full time for a corporation but also run a startup, is it advisable to reflect both on your resume or just pick one that's most aligned with your goals? Um, so, kind of a multi part question, but maybe if I, I've seen a number of questions from reapplicants, and if I could kind of summarize them. Um, you know, what are some of the tips or ways that they can help to differentiate themselves in their new application versus their original? Yeah, absolutely. So we definitely admit reapplicants, and we are excited that you're, you're, you know, giving it another shot to apply to MIT Sloan. We just really sometimes don't have the opportunity to admit all of the great candidates. So please definitely reapply, um, you know, if you didn't get the outcome that you were hoping for this last year or in the past years. Reapplicants, um, we will look at your past application as well as your new application. And so for this reason, I would say submit as much new information as possible. So there's a small text box where we ask kind of what's changed since your last application. But in addition to filling that out, make sure that you give us some more data points. So, you know, your resume should be updated. What are those new kind of impact um, bullets, like the, the accomplishments that you had in your professional career? Think about asking a new recommender for a new letter of recommendation. Make sure you update your cover letter. Um, so again, the cover letter actually doesn't ask, and nowhere on the application do we ask for your post MBA goals. So I certainly understand that sometimes that kind of naturally comes out in the cover letter and that is completely okay, but we are definitely not um, being judgmental or worried in any way, shape, or form if you your goals have changed over the year or you know two years, whenever since you last applied. Um, the reality is, is that MBA students often pivot in what their goals are during you know their core and during their first year. So you are not alone in changing your goals, and and don't worry there. But reapplicants, make sure that you're taking advantage of that real estate. You have two entire applications at the admissions committee. Um, 
is looking at and reviewing for your candidacy. So take advantage and give us as much detail as we can so we can um, advocate for your admission this year. Excellent. All right. And then another kind of component of that question was, how do you reflect your work experience if you both work full time and also um, with a startup or an early stage company? Yeah, absolutely. So I would definitely say include both. We definitely don't want you to pick and choose. Um, we want to know about both things. And so, um, you know, include those details both on your resume as well as in the employment section so we can understand um, if, if the organization is your full-time work, that might be your organizational chart would be the, the full-time employment. Um, but we want to know what you're doing with the startup. So perhaps that's just highlighted in um, your resume in bullets or in, you know, some of the examples that you include in your cover letter, but don't pick and choose, include it all. Great. Um, where should I add technical skills? For example, coding languages, data visualization tools, CRM systems. Should this be an additional information section or somewhere else? Um, in the resume, I believe in the additional information section is a great place to put that. Um, and then again, if there's any courses that you took or certi like certifications that you had, you can include that in the non-degree or professional cert certification section and let us know. All right, this one is about non-English speaking recommenders. If my recommenders are not well-versed in English, um, and their letter seems of poor quality, will that hurt me? Or how should I tackle not, that? Problem? Yeah. So I would say, you know, if they don't speak English, it could be translated. It needs to be a certified translation. You yourself cannot translate it. So if that's a concern, you talk, you should talk to your um, recommender about get, you know, getting that certified translation. Um, and we can definitely work with you. So email our office and we can make sure that, you know, get everything gets added to your file appropriately. However, if your, your recommender does speak English and maybe, you know, there's some grammatical issues within the letter, remember that we're, we're actually not you know, um, we're not evaluating the recommender, we're evaluating you. So to the extent that we understand the content and we can read it, um, you know, we're not going to be judging you based on the, the grammatical errors or, you know, spelling confusion within their letter. Great. Um, is it okay for your letter of recommendation to come from a previous supervisor rather, a, rather than a current supervisor? Yes, um, you know, we'll add a couple caveats here. So the letter of recommendation, we definitely would like to be the most recent to understand kind of your most recent impact in your professional world. But we're also cognizant of that plenty of people are not telling their employers that they're applying, um, potentially leaving for an MBA. Um, so, you know, if, if it is a past employer, or a past supervisor, that's okay. Think about how far in the past it was though. You know, if we're talking someone that, that was many, many years ago and they can't really speak to who you are now, that might not be as impactful or as strong um, to your application and to who you are as an applicant as, as if you were to ask someone more recent. Perfect. Um, okay, so lots of questions here about the org chart and if they should include one or two versions of an organizational chart, if they should include the org chart from their current role as well from a, from a previous role. Um, what's your advice for the org chart? So for the org chart, I would say you really want to be limiting it to your current role, your current organization. Um, there are a couple exceptions to that rule. Um, so military would be one of them, but for the most part, we really only want to see one organizational chart for your current role that you're in. I feel like every year I get, well, I just started a new job in August. What, sh what should I do? Um, you know, tell us where you fall within that organization and kind of where you, where you know, what your reporting structure looks like. Who are you interacting with? Um, again, for consultants, they can do a more recent project. That's really important for us to see kind of who they're working with at the client side of things, as well as within the firm um, and the different roles that they're, they're playing on that project. I would say, um, you know, if you had a previous role at your current organization, you can maybe showcase that on your on that one organizational chart, maybe through like a different square. You can get creative and using colors to show promotion or um, growth within the organization. Um, but also, we will still see any growth within an organization through both your resume as well as the employment section on your application. Yeah, and also, um, just to add to that, we do have a couple sample um, PDFs of org charts that we've seen in the past that have worked well. Those are built into the application, so you'll see that um, when you start an application. 
Um, okay, the next question is um, about timing of when to send an official test score. Should it be submitted before they submit their application or by the time they're invited to interview? Great question. So with um, the application, you only need, you, we only did an unofficial test score. So if you, you can just input your own test score, official test scores won't need to be submitted until kind of the verification process once you're admitted, but we will need that test score unofficial, the unofficial test score at the very least by the admissions deadline. So for round one, September 29th. If you submitted it a few days later, when you know maybe you got it a couple days later, definitely send us an email and update us so we can update your application. But just keep in mind that anything that is submitted after the deadline might not be reviewed by the admissions committee. If you happen to be the person that we start reading their application at you know eight or nine a.m. on September thirtieth, your application may have already already been reviewed. So just thinking about your entire application, getting that submitted by the deadline. Yep. Perfect. Um, do you prefer that the additional reference also be from a current and or previous supervisor or would a coworker or peer be okay for this? I think it's okay for one of your references to be, you know, a colleague or a peer. You definitely want to steer clear of any personal, re letter, uh, personal references. So we're not looking for a family member or a friend in the references. We're really looking for someone who would you ask for a letter of recommendation? And, and perhaps that might be a colleague um, and that is okay, but I would say keep it in the professional realm. Perfect. Um, let's see. Um... I'm trying to there's lots of questions here that are that are similar we've kind of touched on already um all right and what type of a scenario would the admissions committee reach out to my additional reference do you have advice about how we should put for those but i think you know in what situation would we reach out um to our reference it, it really will depend again so for instance if there's you know perhaps your written recommendation isn't as detailed in a particular area that we're looking for when we're kind of looking at the application overall and looking at the different competencies that I talked about, you know, how do you work well, how do you work with others? How do you work in teams? How do you work individually? How do you problem solve? How do you communicate? All of those types of competencies and understanding that throughout the application. Um, you know, if there's still questions that we have, but there's things that we really like about your application, we might want to reach out to one of your references and ask them about their experiences there. Again, it could happen at any point in the application cycle or in the evaluation of your application. So after you're interviewed, if we continue to have questions about, again, one of those competencies, we may we might reach out to a reference. So I can't give you a specific example because every case is unique um, and it is a case by case basis, um, but know that it won't be out of the blue and the best preparation that you can do for your references is to give them that um, GMAT common letter of recommendation, the list of questions. It's the exact same kinds of questions that we would ask a reference that we ask the recommender. Great. Um, all right. My undergraduate GPA is less than 3.5. Is this still acceptable? Yes, absolutely. Um, the GPA, everything is one component to your application, right? So um, we are looking at the entire application as a whole and understanding who you are as an applicant, as an individual, the successes that you've had. Um, for many of you, you know, undergrad may have been a few years ago. So, you know, one of my first slides showed that um, the MBA student has between five and seven years of professional experience. So for those of you that are kind of on the end, the, the later end of that, you know, undergrad was a long time ago. So you may have had so many successes in your professional career that uh, we definitely want to learn about. So, you know, no one is, you know, X'd out of the process or, or cut out just because of a GPA. All right. Um, a question about our joint degree with the Harvard Kennedy School of Government or HKS. Um, can we touch on the application process if someone was applying concurrently to MBA and MPP, which would be the Master of Public Policy. Yeah, absolutely. So you would follow, um, there's, you'd be applying to both. And then on our application, we just ask, are you applying concurrently? So I guess if you're applying in round one, you won't have a decision. You'll just say yes. 
that you're applying concurrently. Um, and then if you are admitted to MIT Sloan, we, we send out a survey to all of the folks that indicated that they were applying concurrently to kind of understand where they um, fall with HKS and, and what their plans for matriculation are. We have both Sloan starters as well as HKS starters. Um, it's more common to be an HKS starter and then come to Sloan, uh, but we can definitely walk you through that process. But really for the application process, it's just two individual applications to HKS and then to us at MIT Sloan, and you're just indicating that you are applying concurrently. Okay. Um, a couple different questions from military candidates. Recently returned from deployment, could I submit both my org chart from deployment as well as um, my org chart from my role stateside? Um, I think you kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but um, if you want to talk a little bit more about org charts um, in, as it relates to military candidates. Yes, absolutely. I, so I, I would say that this is probably that exception that we would like to see both. Um, so if you, the, the short answer is yes to this question. Definitely um, tell us, you know, what your organizational structure was during the deployment as well as when you were stateside. So, you know, we, we can understand kind of how those rules have changed and um, what the different structures look like and where you were involved. Um, there's a bunch of questions for military. So first, I just want to say thank you all for your service. Um, you know, we we really enjoy um, getting to know you throughout the application process. And we do recognize that your experiences are a little bit unique in comparison to someone who maybe has worked in a more traditional path in industry. This one is a question about um, how to represent their military experience if they've then moved on to have professional experience as well. Military experience we think of as your full time job. So if that was your what you were doing full time, that should be represented on your resume and in the employment section as full time work experience. Um, okay, so a question about where to add ongoing courses that someone might be taking. Does that get added to their academic background or is there a special place for it? There's a non-degree coursework section. Um, I think it's called, I think it's under, if, uh, if you're looking at the application on the left-hand side, I think it's called relevant coursework. And then underneath that, I believe there's a non-degree coursework section. We specifically ask for that in the application. So you will certainly see it as you're navigating through the application. Um, you can upload those courses that you're taking. If you've completed that, you can upload certificates or you know certificate of completion, you can upload those. But if it's just ongoing, you can just indicate that it's ongoing. Yeah. Um, a question about the timing for a reapplication. Is it advisable to immediately reapply in the second round if you're not successful in the first round? You cannot do that. Um, so you can only apply one time per cycle. So when we're referring to reapplicants, we're talking to someone that applied last cycle or previous cycle. Um, so for MBA, we have three rounds every cycle. So again, round one is September 29th, round two is in January, and round three is in April. You can only apply in one of those rounds for next year. Um, if you are unsuccessful in that round, uh, you cannot apply to the following admission cycle which will again be September of 2023 and so on and so forth. Um, so yes, you cannot apply twice. And so I guess that's a good clarifying point too, that if you apply for LGO, you are automatically considered for MBA as an LGO applicant. Um, so even if you're not successful on the LGO side, we will consider you for MBA. But if you are not successful overall, you cannot apply to MBA um, in a future round. Great. Um, some questions about tests. So is executive assessment exam um, eligible for our test requirement? Not for the MBA program. For the MBA program, only GMAT and GRE scores are acceptable. And then within which, what time frame is a valid score for the GMAT or GRE? So it's five years from the date of your application. So um, five years from the date of the application. <laughs> Yep, and the dates for that are all built into the application. Um, what if my most recent direct manager and or recommender will have retired by the time of the application? Would that be okay? Yes, absolutely. That's totally fine. Um, keep in mind, you know, we do ask kind of for a professional email address. So keep that in mind. If they do no longer have that email address, you might be a personal email address and you might just want to... Um, send us a note and indicate that that's the reason. Yeah. Um, if my transcripts are in a different language, how should I handle that? You should get them um, 
professionally certified you, or uh, translated. So a certified translation of your transcript. Uh, you should not be translating them yourself. Yeah. Um, a bunch of questions about application fee waivers and how that works. Yeah, absolutely. So if you navigate to the payment section of our application, um, there are a number of different ways that you can qualify for a fee waiver. I'm going to try to remember all of them off the top of my head. So veterans or currently serving in the um, United States Army or uh, excuse me, in the U.S. Armed Services um, are eligible. Current Peace Corps members, um, Teach for America uh, members or alumni, and then we have partnerships with MLT, Leadership Brainery, Admit.me, um, and Jumpstart. And then there's a whole host of other opportunities to get a fee waiver if you've attended MIT related conferences or if you've had um, any kind of connection, I would definitely go on and review the list, you will need to upload um, supporting documentation showing that but it's all details on the payment site. In addition, we also are hosting a number of events where we'll be giving uh, fee waivers away to attendees. So definitely, um, you know, to check out some of our upcoming events. I think um, next week we have all of those identity and inclusion series starting next week that I, I mentioned earlier. And we dropped a link in the chat to register for those. I believe some, if not all of them, will be um, giving away some fee waivers. So hopefully we'll see some of you there. Great. Um, how should I represent my undergraduate GPA in the application? Great. So we put some really specific um, details in the application this year, and hopefully they'll be really clear. We would like you to put in exactly how it appears on your transcript. So um, whatever scale your school is using, put it on that scale. Uh, if they do not have a GPA, we ask you to calculate it, um, but we, ask, we give you very specific um, how specifics on how we want you to calculate it and then you will put how you did the calculation into the application itself so when you go to the academic section um, you will want to report your gpa if that appears on your transcripts your cumulative undergraduate gpa so not your degree only um, your entire cumulative gpa and the scale on which that's reported by your institute if they don't do a um, cumulative gpa we ask you to calculate it um, and tell us how you did that so again refer to the instructions we tried to be very very detailed but if you have questions on it feel free to reach out Excellent. Um, a, a few different questions about the minimum amount of experience required for the MBA. Mm -hmm. Minimum amount of experience is definitely two years. Um, you know, as I said, the average incoming um, loan MBA student has five years of experience. And so we really do see that folks benefit from a, a minimum of two years when they're, um, you know, in the professional, in the professional world, you'll have a lot more to add to the um, cohort to add to your classroom experience, you'll bring in a lot more, you know, pre MBA industry uh, knowledge and experience, which ultimately you as well as your classmates will benefit from. So two years there, um, if you're kind of on the earlier side of that, or if we have any kind of college seniors joining, we do have the MBA early um, offering, which is an opportunity to apply to the MBA program, but on a deferred status. So if you're admitted, you're admitted conditionally upon gaining two to five years of professional experience. So that's something to check out um, if you're thinking about it down the line. Perfect. Um... I can just answer a few of these. The application is live now and all the application dates and deadlines were in the presentation also represented on the web. So the MBA and the Sloan Fellows applications are both live. A couple of questions about that. Um, again, there's some, I don't know if this is from earlier, but how does um, a letter of recommendation or who you would select for a recommender differ from someone you would select as an additional reference? Um, and for us, you know, it's really, you know, the, the individuals would be quite similar. We're looking for somebody to write your letter of recommendation who knows you well and is um, someone who's maybe supervised you in your more recent work experiences, but a reference could be someone, um, you know, that you have worked with in a previous capacity or maybe somebody who um, you work with that maybe isn't um, your direct supervisor, but 
but typically would rank above you. Um, so you're the best person um, to decide that, but there's not a whole lot of difference. If we were to have a, a conversation with one of your references, it would be very similar to the types of questions that we ask on the recommend, recommendation form. Um, and then some questions about, um, is it feasible for students who are entrepreneurs to continue to work in a part-time capacity while studying um, in the MBA? Um, so uh, wait, I, I, yeah, go ahead. You can okay, go ahead. You can go ahead. No, go okay. ahead, Jen. So you know, we're really looking to create um, an all-inclusive experience for your MBA. You know, what you take away from in the classroom is only half of what you're really experiencing in the MBA. We want you to be fully integrated in everything that we have to offer through the conferences, the clubs, the competitions, etc. So you know, being tied to or committed to. Um, you know, a role outside of the MBA really prevents you from fully immersing in this, you know, really once in a lifetime type of experience. Um, so our goal is to admit people who are not working at all, that you, this would be your full time job. Um, however, um, you, you know, sometimes students are you know very lucky and they're able to really grow an early stage company while they're a student and that would come at the trade off of you being able to you know really be involved in some of the other activities. But um, from a starting point, we would like to see that you're fully engaged in the MBA experience, at least from the beginning. Um, let's see. I saw a couple about um fellowship opportunities. Do you want to talk about? Fellowship oh, yeah, I have some of those slides. Uh, yeah. yeah, so what types of financial support are available for students, both international students and domestic? Um, so we offer a number of different merit based fellowships. Um, you would be um, awarded that fellowship at the time of admission in your acceptance letter. Um, uh, this year, the incoming class close to 40% or about 40% of the students coming in have received some type of a fellowship. The fellowship amounts really vary. Um, there are hardly any full tuition awards. Um, and then, you know, for the most part, an average award is around thirty-five dollars to $40,000. Um, it varies a little bit year to year. And then there's a whole spectrum of awards in between that. Um, you know, we consider, you know, everything about your candidacy um, when determining who we award fellowships to. Um, and as I said, they are merit-based fellowships. Um, there's a list of, I know there's a bunch of questions here about a list of external fellowships. So our website does detail a number of different fellowships that Sloan or MIT um, has control over. There are, you know, dozens of external resources that you can look into for fellowship funding um, that would not be a source um, at MIT. And, you know, it's, it's hard for us to really create a robust list for that. I know a lot of different governments out there and, um, you know, some other research type organizations will sponsor MBA candidates, um, but it will really, that varies greatly depending on your background. Um, I did see one other question here. Someone asked if they could be deferred to a different round. And so I think this question might be saying if they applied in round one, could they potentially not be considered until round two? And how would that work? Um, I can answer it if you want. Yeah, and maybe we can wrap up after that. I know it's already a minute after one. I know. Um, so I guess with the, with this question, I would say we do waitlist without an interview. So there is a chance that we would say we're waitlisting you and you'll hear from us in round two by the interview decision date. So um, that's what I'm guessing you mean by defer to the next round. Um, and so there's always an opportunity. So I think the, the takeaway from that is applying earlier gives you a, a longer life cycle within the application process at MIT Sloan. So if you... Um, you know, apply in round one, and we're not able to offer you an interview, we might be able to push you to round two and potentially interview in a future round. So applying early is great. And as Jen indicated, we are a little over. We thank all of you for coming. I know we had so many questions. We answered a ton, um, but I'm sure there's still more. We will be hosting more um, app tips webinars and other uh, chats and things so to keep an eye out for that. And as I indicated, all of those events coming up are a great way to stay connected with our uh, with our team, as well as our students and our alums, and learn more about the MIT Sloan community. Um, and we're here to answer any questions. Remember that we're your advocates and looking forward to getting to know you throughout the application process. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.